Hello, good morning to everyone and welcome to another Europark webinar. For those who don't know us, Europark is the largest and oldest network of protected areas in Europe. We support our members by promoting networking and building their capacities. However, this time, the, the webinar we get into the river is going to be a bit different. It will be half away between a dialogue and a classic webinar, in which we will intersperse a classic presentation with some questions. So if you have questions, please feel free to write them down in the chat. We will make our best to answer them if time allows. My name is Teresa Pastor, and I coordinate the Peru-Urban Parks Commission within Europark. And in this commission, way before the pandemic, we were already questioning ourselves, is my park uh, crowded? If yes, how much? And the big question, what could I do about it? Since the pandemic, these questions have become even more relevant. We are conscious that the topic we are bringing today is very complex, difficult, and we are aware that we have a limited time. So the aim of this session is just to introduce some concepts and share, and share some examples, but none of them will be explained with full details. The, uh, the two experts that we have today have many scientific publications that we will refer next week with outcomes of the webinar. So with no further ado, ado I, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, Ricardo Nogueira Mendes, he's a biologist with a post-graduation in natural tourism. He has advanced studies in geography and regional planning, and he, had, uh, he has a PhD in sports science. Currently, he's a research at the uh, University of Lisbon. Carlos Pereira da Silva is a geographer. He's a lecturer at the Department of Geography and Regional Planning and a researcher at Tix uh, Nova Interdisciplinary Center of Social Science from the new University of Lisbon. Both of them have over 20 years of experience on issues related uh, with the management, use, experience, and visitation of protected areas. They work uh, involve carrying capacity through applied research and collaboration with local and regional authorities, a, a key aspect. I have to say that origin originally another geographer, Carlos Mario Canal Lozano from the University of Barcelona was scheduled, but unfortunately he had a serious health problem and can no longer attend. I wish him uh, from here uh, a prompt recovery. I am uh, therefore especially thankful to Carlos Pereira da Silva, who kindly agreed to step in uh, on his behalf. So I would like to start by uh, posing a question to both speakers. Um, in your opinion, when should the protected area manager start envisaging calculating the current capacity of a space? Well, my my best option will be before problems start to 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 happen and to exist. Uh, in short, uh, just to to be sure of it, I, I want also to to thank you for Europark to to for the invitation and uh, a small disclaimer. Please note that our opinions and the examples that we're sharing maybe apply to the places where we've been working. Okay, they, they are not. Uh, 100% copy paste to be applied in other places. They could be adapted, obviously. And for sure, there's going to be some bias regarding our opinion and our experience that is being shared here. So please bear, bear that in mind, okay? And uh, I have another question. Why should a protected area manager cares about carrying capacity? Yeah, can I share my, my screen just to show you some slides yes please of course okay that will help you to see what i, I mentioned okay so thanks thanks very much to Europark park for the invitation of being here uh it's a pleasure to to share with uh, with you our experience uh and like uh, i just want to stress again like uh, uh ricardo just mentioned this is not one size fits all it's basically everything has to be adapted to the local conditions as you are going to see. It's just not, it's not so easy like just a number. Uh, just to put you in the context and give you some ideas about the, the theoretical um, uh, studies that are behind reaching a, a number, uh, the, this this idea, like uh, Ricardo has been saying, uh, came and Teresa already mentioned, 
with uh, increasing numbers that we see. This this is a, a reference of one of the, the studies that pointing like uh, 8 billion people visiting uh, the, 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 the protected areas. And we know that this number is underrated for sure. And, and clearly with the pandemic, uh, one thing that that, that uh, stressed quite well is we need to monitor the, these things a little bit better, and uh, clearly this concern already started to to rise in many places uh, because there is the, the crowding, uh, the, the the problems with the impact, and clearly also the recreation recreational experience that is declining, and. Uh, certain areas you, you probably already know in many places of, of the world that we are trying to 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 restrict the access, uh, putting numbers. And this is the example of Machu Picchu, but there is many places all around the world that they are, they define a number, and uh, and they sell tickets or 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 the access according to the, those numbers, and that is the problem. Uh, the number uh, is basically. Uh, uh, the, the 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 one million question is how many are too many? Uh, uh, what is the the maximum number of people that we should uh, point it as the limit of in the managing uh, managing purposes? And th this is the, the 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 moment where the thing starting to be a little bit complex. Probably most of you are familiar with this uh, scheme from the the Butler where all touristic destinations should be in one point of this curve, and clearly a protected area would be the same. <clears throat> Not forgetting that uh, uh, the, what is the, the, the first idea of a protecting area, that is the, the, the protection of some uh, com ecological uh, and uh, environmental values. But uh, th this is uh, um, showing during the, the time the number of of, of uh, visitants is increasing according to the popularity of the city, uh, of the place. But like I mentioned, this is not a, just a question of a number. The, the, the evolution of that scheme to another one developed from Jensen in 2007 is showing that is not only the people that is increasing during the time, but the type of tourists. And clearly we know that in certain places, in the first ones that are in the bottom of the curve, are the ones that are more linked to nature values, more more awareness of of the environmental um, behaviors that are supposed to be the right. And when the the place is going to massify, the people that are on the top are not the uh, so concerned about that. Uh, there are other topics that are more important to them, like prices and, and things like that. And that is one of the the the, fir the first thing that you have to take in mind. It's not not just a question of how many, but who they are. Because you have to that to have that in 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 consideration. Uh, from the from the bottom, starting to, from from the beginning, this carrying capacity is a concept that has started from a grazing, uh, basically to un to understand how many uh, uh, cattle heads could be in a, in a in a grazing area without having a decline. Of the resource that was the beginning of this of this concept. That after that has been adapted to the uh, recreation area, and basically trying to combine three things is uh, a physical um, uh, carrying capacity, basically the, the the number that can be over there uh, in a physical sense, environmental uh, the number uh, after that there is a decline. And a social thing that is a crowding that the the, the recreation experience, uh, experience starting to decline. So it's basically physical, biological, and social, and also economic to manage that area. So this is clearly a little bit more complex. Like I mentioned, that not just mention how many uh, are they. It's not clearly a magical number. It, uh, when we start doing the, the studies, everyone is reaching for, give me a number, give me a number. No, it's not just a number. Uh, it's much more than that. You have to be very careful in the way that you address to this. And clearly, uh, when this started, uh, the, uh, this started in the 60s, then in the, in the 80s, in the 90s, there is a lot, has, has been under a huge criticism. This is an example of those criticism, uh, mainly because the way that this has been being applied is like what we were mentioning is a one size fits all, just giving a formal and applied to the place. And the, the criticism that, that has, has been done to this is just uh, uh, the, the, the lack 
of understanding uh, of the concept and developing of the concept. I think that we've driven a lot from there. There is a huge amount of research that have, have been done after that, and we are much better nowadays uh, since then. So uh, what is the starting point when you want to, 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 to start using the carrying capacity? The first thing is, what is the object when you are assessing the uh, carrying uh, the carrying capacity? Uh, the the object for controlling visitants, protecting certain kind of areas, mixing the, both of them, and then you must have information and a reference uh, starting point. So it's, the the reference starting point is quite important. So you could understand what is the limit of the change that is acceptable before the decline so it's uh, it's basically to consider from the moment that you starting to to have a decline of the air and that is the reason why ricardo mentioned this is something that you have to to start using and uh, putting in place before reaching to that limit so you know that you have to intervene when that limit has been uh, overtaken so like i mentioned uh, it's physical ecological socio demographic and political and economic because it's management and clearly there is a, a weighting that can be changed according to the characteristics of the area. More tourists, more use, according to the area, that is more peri-urban park with more, more uh, pressures, uh, uh, most remote. So you have to play with all of these things according, again, with the objects of, of, of the management. So uh, like, like I mentioned to, to you, I think it's a little bit too big, uh, what you are looking around here is basically not just how many you, you are just you need to understand who are they uh, so you we use surveys uh, to, to the people not to understand uh, just who are they backgrounds and so but also why they are using that area that is helpful to also to manage uh, the, the area uh, where are they going how they behave over there and normally we use automatic counters to uh, to count people in the trails or in the areas um cameras to take uh, take uh, time lapse cameras to take pictures and understand where uh, people are doing and they're behaving and all of this information is going to to help you to understand how many uh, are they so um, let, let me put also in the context of the Portuguese situation about this because we're starting using the carrying capacity con uh, concept uh, in the in the in the 90s and it was applied to beaches uh, and uh, it was interesting. Uh, you, you see here, this is our last paper that we produced at about the 25 years of using this, this concept that was published and presenting a review about this concept in the case of the beaches. All the beaches in Portugal nowadays, the touristic beaches, have a beach plan in a very detailed scale, uh, scale 1 to 1,000, and every beach has a carrying capacity uh, defined. And that is important for, for understanding what is the available area for recreational use, uh, for parking areas, support infrastructures. And that, that was the, our, our point for applying that to, to protected areas. Uh, this is a beach plan, as you see here, with the location of infrastructures, the support measures, everything that can be helpful around here. Uh, and if you apply this for parking, uh, it's basically to, to help you to maintain and, uh, and monitor the, the, the trails, to provide uh, proper infrastructure adapted to the number of visitants uh, and for parks accessibility. And that is the way that we think that the, the carrying capacity should be applied uh, to, to, the, to the management. But Carlos, I have a question. Yeah. Because when we were explaining that uh the number the current capacity number in fact relates with the type of people does it mean yeah. then depending on the type of people you will have a bigger number or a larger or a short, um, smaller number yeah because like like i mentioned okay. in the beginning uh when you see the 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 ingham um scheme showing that different people uh, behave differently yeah. and if you understand uh who are the visitors over there. So you can adapt, for instance, if you need to raise awareness uh, of certain behaviors, you should concentrate on that. If you should put more sign signage to, 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 convey, to, to inform people, uh, you should do that. That would be according to the kind of people that you have over there. We know that when the, the numbers are not so high, 
people in, in remote areas. Normally, the people that go over there are people much more concerned with the with the nature and environment. So they will be a much more, shall we say, uh, um, proper behavior in that those areas. If an area is more massified, probably people will not be aware of that. So it's a different strategy that you have to be adapted. So it's not only counting, that is the thing that I want to stress, okay. but you need to also to have some information from the background of the people that are over there. Yes, so, someone in the chat is saying that in fact, it's depending where you come from, uh, this, this perception, this social carrying capacity or psychological carrying capacity, the, mm -hmm. the level of standing crowd is different. If you come from China yeah. or you come we, from we call you know, we call we call from uh, the social caring capacity yeah. uh, basically and it's interesting that that uh, that is mentioned because for instance in certain of the studies that we mentioned before the the, the shall we say the environmental caring capacity being uh, overcome the social caring capacity is normally uh, uh, the first one to be overcome so when is the crowding. People don't feel comfortable, and normally, because this has to be managed also in certain areas as a tourist resource, people will run away from there if it's crowded. So that is another of, of the reasons why this, this information from, from the surveys is clearly important uh, for, for managing the area. Yeah, but what I understand then, in some time, at some, at some period, we can have some type of people, and then the aim of the protected area would be to either change the type of yeah, people flexibility. or to flexibility. So yeah, in flexibility. time, you can change this current capacity number. Yeah, flexibility. So and clearly in, in areas with, with, uh, with, with during the year, there is a, a peak moment. Clearly, you must invest in certain areas about certain management strategy instead of others according to the to the numbers what you have to do with the current capacity is, is knowing that after when you reach a threshold or a number, probably you should start doing another management strategies for, for doing that. So yeah. that is the reason why carrying capacity is important. Yes, yeah. talking about this, what type of measures uh, can be put in place once you have decided uh, yeah. you haven't reached a current capacity? Uh, perhaps Ricardo yeah, wanted the... to answer that or, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll start to, to yeah. present on my side, but um... Some, some of the measures, uh, and these have been uh, related and presented in various methods and frameworks, <laughs> we're just pointing three of the most uh, used uh, and, uh, and acceptable nowadays. Uh, and uh, Carlos, can I start to share on my side? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to... Okay, and I'm going to share my screen in order to start from this moment on. Okay, so measures, as you were asking, Teresa, I would present uh, uh, these five as, as an example. Zoning, you have different types of use within protected areas regarding uh, people access and things like that. So it could be a good way to, to do it. Obviously it goes together with regulation in some times restricting or even forbidding activities in some places it is related with zoning. Another uh, um, idea which is happens a lot here with, with beach management, for example, they have sacrificed areas, places where you concentrate more people and other places where you try to disperse impacts. For example, we have some some beaches that are urban beaches, obviously these will have much more use than the, the beaches that are far away from cities and that less accessible, for example. Other ways that happens, as uh, Carlos showed in the beginning in Machu Picchu, and we'll have another example with taxes, permits, so paying to access uh, to visit the area. And obviously always environment education and errors awareness is, is important in order to, to, to deal with the uh, uh, carrying capacities, okay? Um, I will pass to Carlos for him to present this this example. I think it yes. might be interesting uh, for uh, for the audience. Yes, uh, just just was one second one one question from from the chat, and then please uh, show this uh, example. Uh, Brian Torno uh, from the New Forest Association is asking that once there's the baseline visitor number, uh, but uh, beyond simply not making things work uh, worse, uh, how uh, man uh, our managing bodies are attempting a special strategy that er erroneously suggests some portions of severely protected areas 
are more robust than others. Is there a way to correct this? Some, some areas inside the protected area are more robust, can stand better this uh, carrying capacity than others. Is there a way to correct this? I, I think that this could, could really uh, relate with, uh, with, with this, both zoning and sacrificing areas. Obviously, that you have places that are more sensitive for death, this is press, uh, uh, for example, offering less trails, recreation, uh, dividing uh, or splitting people for not access to that place, not for bidding because in many places uh, access to, to, to protected areas is free, for example. But if you have uh, all the pointing the signals going for the peak mountain, obviously not everybody will follow that if, and will lose other aspects that could be visited and that could accommodate uh, uh, visitors uh, um, with more uh, easy uh, and, and satisfaction, which is also important in the middle of this. Uh, I think that we have a couple of examples uh, now that we could uh, share and yeah, we'll get back to, to, to these examples later on. Okay, okay, perfect. So Carlos, do you want to go for Formzinho as an example, a simple one? Your mic is off. The example that we have here is basically about uh, the application of this. This is a, a first example that was made by a colleague of us uh, during his master's degree that uh, worked with with me about the natural parks in uh, in the, in um, near Lisbon, the capital of Portugal, and that there is a trail that was really really used and has uh, severe problems. Um, it was one of the most popular ones. Yep. So basically, the first thing is it's in these areas, you always have to start doing the, the reference uh, situation about the, the environmental values. So basically, we have been uh, collecting information about the, the characteristics, not only of the trail, but al also uh, all, all the area around. And with that, with uh, not only the vegetation, but always uh, also the, the, the geology and so, uh, we could understand there is there was a huge biophysical sensitivity. Yep. Uh, steep slopes, um, uh, lots of erosion, and clearly more than 80% have a high biophysical sensitivity. Uh, and it was an area that was under a huge pressure. And what the natural park uh, uh, asked and was working with, with Luis is basically to, to determine what would be the, 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 the carrying capacity number uh, for this trail. So we there was another another aspect that have to be taken in consideration, like the the safety uh, for of the users according to the erosion and the and the the, the slopes that were were over there. Um, clearly, with the service that we made, there was a number of people that was already not uh, enjoying the experience because of the size of the group and the, the, the encounters that they have over there. So with that, uh, the, the characteristics that we had from 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 the area and with the surveys, we consider that the groups uh, that should be around there would be between four to fifteen people, according to the to the to the stopping areas and and the, and the safety procedures. And the daily maximum of people that would should be allowed to go over there would be around forty five. And that was the first attempt that have been made for managing this area. Yep. Uh, I will uh, present another example also uh, regarding uh, trails. In this case, it's a natural park close by to Barcelona, as you can see down there on the map on the left side. There's a lot of uh, uh, weekend residents around this area, so there's a lot of pressure for people to disconnect from the urban life and to visit this place. The main attractions of this, uh, this natural park is the, the peak of uh, Montcau, and uh, the monastery of La Mola, another peak. And um, what we've been presented in the map is like the, 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 all the trails that are available and are promoted by the park. And uh, we have uh, uh, work around this park in order to establish a carrying capacity. This was the objective, but since we didn't have the uh, starting point data for, to, to, to go directly to that point, we did uh, an entire year survey and First of the things that we have decided is that we have to approach this not as, as one place, but there are two subsectors. There are people that visit the north part of the park mainly, and people that visit the south part of this trail. 
And in many cases, it happens that people cross from one side to the other. And as if you see here in this, this, uh, this map, in this figure, there's a large number of stretches that are with common users. So people go to the same destination, but they could access from different places. And this raises a, a, a more complex analysis regarding how should the visitation in this in this particular area should be should be managed. So from our first year looking around, doing uh, uh, samples, uh, surveys, and things like that, we have about thirteen thousand uh, uh, sample points asking people where are you coming from, what are you going, where are you, where are you uh, living, for example. So a very short. Uh, survey in order to understand who are the visitors and what they're looking for. And we reached that about 83% of the use was concentrated in one side of the, this, uh, this trail and other 17% on the Northern side. And this was this, this distribution. This is in Spain. So you can see that the, um, the, the Eastern week is very important in terms of massification and crowd using because everybody in Spain is on holidays during that time. And also in this case, because it's close to the city, um, October is also a very important moment because during the summer it's too hot and people go for holidays in other places. So we have nearly two moments that are stressed in terms of crowding, which is Eastern that moves, it's not always the same, the same week. And also the post summer when people get back to their normal uh, activity. Uh, we have in this in this uh, part we have been applying a sequential method, and in this case in particular, and from previous experience uh, looking for what should be used as uh, real carrying capacity reducing factors, we have been adding in each different part more more um, more data. So from the starting point of weather, environment, reliability, trail type, difficulty, social perception. We've been adding other aspects such as seasonality, infrastructures, comparability of uses, sections that are common, which happens quite a lot. If people disperse themselves in other trail and things like that. And after computing all these and taking into account that in this part in particular, there's a lot of base data regarding priority habitats, for example, and also sensitive areas in this case for birds of prey, we could try to uh, apply and, and, and create a methodology that could discount the number of people that are interacting too much with these sensitive areas. And uh, from just an example for La Mola's use, which is the southern side, we have about 100,000 people of excess visits um, regarding what is the proposed carrying capacity according to our method that has been discussed with park authorities uh, from the surveys, with some of the, the, the stakeholders and, and things like that. One of the things that was contributing for this excess of purse of visitation was a particular parking place. So one of the action that was taking into account immediately after that was that that parking place was closed. We are not um, stopping people to access this recreational area and to visit and to hike around, but we are making it a little bit more difficult. So we are decreasing some of the, the use because of that. Another aspect that was very popular was that people would go to La Mola because there was a restaurant in the monastery and uh, there were some uh, issues regarding uh, ecology aspects and, and garbage and the maintenance of the place, energy, all that, and this is being changed. So people could visit the place, but now they are not being attracted by this particular destination that needs to be uh, requalified in order to, to, to work properly. Okay, another example, and I will pass this to, to Carlos. Yes, uh, but uh, let me interrupt yep. you here, Ricardo, because yep. we have some, some interesting questions in, in the chat. Uh, I just also wanted to say, uh, with this example that you have just showed us, that this is the typical uh, behavior of periurban parts, that we get a lot of visitors, uh, either in autumn or even in, in, in winter, because people are close to cities in the weekends where they go, mm -hmm. and, and the low numbers in, in, in summer. Um, so the questions that are, are posed is that uh, now to give, uh, I mean, for you or for Carlos eh, to answer, that now that, that there are natural disasters like uh, climate change, do still would zoning would work because perhaps one of these zones would be not so attractive uh, to, be, uh, to, to people anymore. So what is what about no, the, the experience of the visitor? 
Well, uh, it, it's difficult to, 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 to change things because we have these uh, uh, actions going in one year and then the year after that you have a dry or it rains too much. So usually for management in, in protected areas, you have management plans that goes for 10 to 15 years. And this is the, the, the regulation, at least with the examples that we have from Portugal and Spain goes like that. Obviously, that one of the things that needs to be uh, taken into account is that since this is not a fixed and a magic number, maybe in some situations you could just say, look, you cannot visit because it's uh, raining too much and it's dangerous for everybody, or because you have uh, an extreme dry situation and fire could start to, to, to in any moment and it's difficult to, to help and to rescue everybody. If all the people around and normal visitors understand that this is something that could happen, maybe they could acknowledge. The issue regarding peri-urban parks is that uh, people need to recreate themselves. And if you have cities with 1 million, 5 million inhabitants, for example, all these small spots of green areas that we have around uh, in, in, in Barcelona, in Lisbon, in, in Paris, in Brussels, are usually uh, big attractions for, for people to, to refresh a little bit because it's the only place that is not related, not similar to cities, which is, our daily life. I don't know if Carlos has some some other uh, uh, options or suggestions no. regarding this. No, uh, it's no, yeah, it's it's in in your line because, like uh, you were mentioning, the, we need to have some flexibility first. Uh, we have to to have in mind safety of the users, and clearly you have to be quite careful on that. You you saw in the previous example, probably it was a little bit too quick. That was one of the main issues, safety. So in clearly, if the the situation is changing, you must be prepared for doing that. And like, like uh, we we stress a lot, the uh, carrying capacity. It's not management. It's a tool for management. Uh, it's another piece of the jigsaw of the puzzle. And clearly, there are. I, I'm just looking at the chat at the same time. And clearly, some of the ideas that are here are pointing on that. You can, for instance, when you see that the things are overcrowded, probably uh, working in a network means that you can divert pressures to another areas that have the similar characteristics, but they are not so well known. And clearly the current capacity gives you the, the red flag for, for that. And, and managing in, in, in network, like uh, people are saying, uh, we have a network of, uh, it's not just a single one, mainly because most of the activities that you are going to do that or the enjoyment can be done in other areas also. So everything has to be put in, in context and, and being flexible. It's just not pointing a number closed and run it f over there. Uh, and, and clearly the social perception is clearly important. Uh, uh, we, we saw already in lots of places that people are going for enjoying the area, but they are they, they are crowded. They take, they take lovely pictures of the area, but they are surrounded by millions of people because it's just for the Instagram or so. But clearly there is a problem over there because the impact of that is is quite 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 big. Yeah, but the, the thing about um, having and um, programming or, or managing or, or, or planning at the network uh, level, which for me would be ideal, is the distance also between the different spaces. Sometimes, yes, we we can say yes, <laughs> <laughs> no, we want to put in, uh, or to to, to drive people to somewhere else. But the thing is that there's this proximity thing, no? If it's a daily day or even a weekend, and and one part is much more accessible than the other one and we don't want them to take cars because uh, that would be created no. other problems so it's not i mean no uh, that's uh, not uh, so easy yeah and perhaps we also need to to as, as is no. suggested in the chat no to perhaps to to develop bigger areas that, that, no. that we already have and and do some interesting infrastructure no to, no no one no one said that was easy because uh, that's <laughs> the problem no, that is that is the problem that we have yeah. because um special nowadays that we see the numbers are increasing everyone is looking for for that experience uh the, that that is a problem we have to find like you were saying uh and people are are mentioning here in the chat you, you have to develop combined strategies like for instance uh, uh investing in in, in uh, interpretation centers where people can stay a little bit longer and then moving mm -hmm. um areas that could be like honeypots that attract people to certain places and that they will be here there enjoying with less impacts and diverting and that is is the thing there is a lo lots of strategies that can be used after you have the the the, the diagnosis of the problem 
like I mentioned, is you you, you have the number saying, okay, we have a problem. So after that, the, the 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 management strategies, probably most of you know better than I, there is lots of things that can be done to manage that. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Uh, let's let, let, let's move on. Uh, well, the examples that you have just shown uh, was were a focus on trades. But yeah. no, now we are, we are really thinking on all like this networking yeah. or larger areas. So, do you have an example? Can you share with us an example of, uh, mm. uh, yeah, carrying yeah. capacity at a bigger area level? I, th I think yeah, we perfect. can share. We can share this. This is a, a a small natural reserve that we have in Portugal. It's a small island, but at the same time, is attracts a lot of people uh, during during uh, the, the summer season, and clearly there was a problem. You know. Uh, like we mentioned, the, the first thing that we, we need good data for the, having the good decisions. And most of the things sometimes the fail because we, we started from, from uh, misperceptions and not having the right data. This is the, 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 our starting point. It, this was a, a live project that we were involved. And clearly in this, uh, the Berlanga Island visitation, we had numbers in the 98 25,000. The last ones before starting the project was 40,000. And we know that the numbers could be much higher than that. So we started the protocol, um, and clearly the impacts, the small islands, for instance, the, the garbage, take the litter from over there. And there is so, a, a small dock that is over there where all the, the, the boats came. Uh, you see the um, people uh, putting over there, waiting for, for the time to, to arrive or to get back. And clearly there was a huge problem of uh, of managing the visitation and the, the, the current capacity could be a good start. Yeah. Uh, so we started doing surveys, uh, countings, and like uh, 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 we mentioned before, we starting also to develop a tool that was call, called the visitation barometer. We basically asking to the visit the visitors um, three uh, small, two small uh, indirect questions to understand what was the 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 um, the, the perception of the visit that they had, and that gave us a lot of information for inst for starting. Uh, can we go? Yeah, uh, we, we understand that the starting point was wrong. That was forty thousand, and we start seeing that the numbers were increasing: sixty-five, seventy-nine, and more than eighty thousand people. And normally, concentrated in in two small spots that are over there, where are the 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 red uh, <clears throat> the red uh, balls pointing over there. This is a small island. Ninety percent of the people were concentrated over there with safety uh, issues and clearly a problem that has to be done. So uh, with that and the questions that we made, can we just go Yep, uh, with, the, with the visitation barometer that we put, asking to the people every year how they, they, they felt about the experience and the number of people. And we understood that according to the measure that has been implemented, what was the general satisfaction of, of the visitants. And that helped a lot the managers to understand if what they were doing right was well, what they were doing was working or not, and how the things could, could be changed. The first one was about the crowding, uh, and clearly um, we could see that the numbers uh, were, were were going to the red, meaning that uh, in the 2021, uh, too many people was clearly uh, the problem, but also at the same time, the satisfaction of the visit was, was okay. So meaning that too many people, but satisfaction was okay. It was a little bit uh, um, a paradox, but help us to, to, to put some measures on, on place. The other one was about several aspects of the area, um, how they, they have changed. And here, clearly, the measures that have been adopted uh, uh, increased a lot the satisfaction of, of the people about the cleaning, about the environment, the quality, the infrastructures, uh, and so on. Clearly, uh, the management improved a lot the conditions over there. As the main result of this project was we, there was a current capacity that was defined, 550 visitants per day. At, at the same time at the island, that helped a lot to, to, to reduce some of the impact. The tourist operators that were bringing people and taking people from, from there uh, were reduced uh, <clears throat> to improve the quality. And there was a portal and uh, of, of visitors that was implemented with a, with a fee being charged. Uh, and the, 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 with, the, with the revenue being uh, being invested in the reserve. As you clearly see here, this, the current capacity was a starting point, 
to implement another another uh, measures that could help to 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 improve the quality of the uh, of the visit but at the same time not uh, not to to forget that the that was a natural reserve that should should be uh should be uh, uh taking in consideration let me just say one thing and and, and linking with with one of the, the things that i saw here in the chat when we normally do the surveys we do the service especially in the areas like these ones we do the surveys to the to the to the tourists and work uh, with the stakeholders the local stakeholders so because like they are mentioned here the crowding effect it's not only for the visitors but the local populations also so that has to be taken in consideration yeah well, i have one question why would people just um concentrate in the 85 percent in only one area is this just the type of tourist only beach people that go to such a beautiful place there, there are oh. that, that is a natural reserve we are a very restricted access basically yeah. saying that there are two trails where people can go okay. and the, the, where the people are concentrated is basically where is the small area that we call the bathing area a small beach and where all the first infrastructures are the restrooms, the restaurants, the bars, and the place where people uh, start and, and 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 live. So that is the reason why people normally are concentrating over there. And again, that is a, a safety problem. Yeah, but no, as the way as I see it, we somehow we want to promote people to stay in these honey uh, honey pot uh, yeah. areas or whatever. But then mm -hmm. at the same time, with if there's too much concentration, then we are not happy either. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and we attract this kind of people that stand massification, not these other kind of people that are more uh, <laughs> sensitive in, to nature. And that will in, do the in, in the, the case training. in the case of Perlingas, this is like a, a, a very nice example because it's it's small. The access it's it's just done by boat, so it's easy to ask people to count people. For example, of the numbers that we have achieved here, we've been counting on on the dock waiting for the boats and counting people out of them. Because if we ask for the tour operators, how many tickets have you sell? They won't sell us because they might think that we are trying to tax them more because they have higher economical activity and what's happening. So in order to, to, to do this, we usually sit and count. And that's, that's uh, at the same time, we're showing our face to the people so that at the end, when we present results and we discuss results and strategies, people at least acknowledge <laughs> that the work is being done and it is done with the, uh, with the neutrality regarding what's the aspects that are related with here. Uh, regarding Berlinga, one of the issues that concentrates so many people is that besides the two trails, it's very windy and it's not uh, really one of those places uh, very pleasant. If it is a hot day, there is no shadows at the island because it's just a rock mainly. So that's why people concentrate themselves so much in that in that in that area. Okay, in, in this particular place. But is it not true? And there was a question about this uh, that sometimes protected area is like the or the protected area or even the tourist board eh, of that area uh, make publicity or marketing towards uh, a kind of visitor, more sportive people or more whatever people it, instead it, of more naturalist people? It, it, it happens a lot uh, in the way that uh, these destinations are advertised and how they communicate yeah. for example if you go for any of the websites that of the tour operators that take people to the to the island and this is nature tourism because you're visiting a natural reserve okay so it is being included as a nature tourism offer. People need to be educated and to understand how it works, all the uh, ecological aspects of the reserve. But if you go to the website, you'll see the beach without anyone there. And the beach usually, the, the, there is these things of the, the, the high and low tide that could reach almost four meters in, in, in change in terms of, of water, okay? And at the low tide, you could have something like 330 users at the beach. So it's like a small colony of penguins. It's not really a beach as we have in the mainland in Portugal or as you have in Spain or something like that. So usually people are going for something that it doesn't exist because it's being badly communicated. And it's one of the important things of raising awareness, for example, not just for visitors, but also for tour operators. People need to know in advance because they are going to be there for four hours or five hours that where they are going to visit. In some cases, people reach the island and ask where is the auto, uh, uh, where is the, the, the auto dealer to take money that doesn't exist. 
for instance, can rent a car to visit the island, for example, which is almost endotic. There is no cars in the island. So the, the and people are going there with thinking that they are going to visit an island like any other, and you may have facilities and supports and things like that. So it's one of the reasons why in some cases you have some uh, crowding uh, aspects. It's it's important also to 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 stress that uh, some of these uh, results were coming out from the COVID um, uh, period, where you have the crowding's uh, perception changing because of other issues, not just the amount of people, but also I don't want to get the disease from that guy. So I, I feel more crowded, even if there is no problem in these particular places. I didn't remember any any uh, COVID uh, infection massively spread in, in the island, but it's also important to, to, to take that in, in mind. I have I have uh, two questions either for you or uh, for Carlos. So, is it allowed in in Portugal to charge visitors directly for management of this run or this run? Or I mean, should the protected areas be public, like in most uh, areas in Europe, and not direct money can be uh, asked a, a, for? A, a very easy one. This is the only places in Portugal where a visitation uh, tax is being charged. And the idea was to help and to regulate the number of users and to discipline a little bit the, 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 the business of taking people to the island. All the rest of the, the protected areas in Portugal, they are open. Most of them are private owned by other people, not by the state itself. So they're, they're, they're open. And uh, it's an issue that is important. We're not just talking about European yeah. cases, but also in yeah. Africans like that. It's, it's really important. Let, let me just just uh, to stress one thing that has been uh, pointed here in the chat. Uh, actually, two things. First of all, we we deal with the local populations as stakeholders. Uh, we do workshops with them, uh, and, and they are the first ones with whom we share the measures and the numbers that we have. For instance, when we are sharing the uh, pointing the numbers of visitants to the Berlin, it was with the tourist operators that we share first the numbers to see if they were according. That is important. And um, there is a, another one that is clearly uh, important here in the chat uh, about the, the application of the fee. Uh, the, we uh, There is different uh, classifications. For the locals, there was no fee that be, was being charged to them. So uh, that helped a lot to also the... the the, the the welcoming of of this situation okay yeah so my my question but um, you have um uh, uh, answered a little bit is about the, the how the relationship with the tourism hmm. yeah i would imagine that the question of this is related with tourism operators you you freeze a little bit, Teresa. You are oh, asking sorry. about tourist, tourist yeah, yeah, operators. No. Yes, yeah? yeah, yeah, yes. If they are really, I mean, I understand they agreed with the, this decision of reducing the numbers. Since we, you we were them, quite surprised or... because the first time that uh, the the natural reserve managers uh, limit the number of trips that they could do, uh, we were waiting to be crucified in the next meeting, and the, the first uh, mm -hmm. operator was really really clear. I think that it works much better. We have worked much better with our clients. We could provide a better service. Although there are some aspects that I will exchange. And this was related with the hours of the day that they could do the trip and things like that. One of the things that happens during these uh, 10 years that we've been working in Berlin is that usually people will be delivered to the island in the morning. So everybody went on the morning, the boats were going with tourists and coming empty and then going back with more tourists. And we reached numbers of 1,300 people being delivered to the island at the same time. So during that uh, lunchtime, it was impossible to be on the island, okay? After all these measures have been applied, one of the things that happened is that people do a visitation in the morning and another visitation in the afternoon. Because actually, four hours is more than enough for most of the visitors that want to, 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 to be acquainted with the place and to visit for the first time. Okay, And this has increased the numbers of clients for tourist operators. We have a lot of days with more than 1,000 landings on the island, but in two different moments. While before, it used to be all going in at the same time and all coming back at the same time, which was more, much more tricky. So... Surprisingly, and this is a good lesson that we've learned for other projects, 
showing the, how we work, show, giving the face and talking with the tourist operators and stakeholders in, in direct and not by by reports only, it, it's very, very good and very important. Okay, yeah, my last question is that, of course, we are talking about in Iceland, so somehow it's easy to control this uh, when you reach this current capacity number, uh, 550 visitors, but then how will you do it in another place, in a, in a forest, in a hill? What, what, what strategies can you use when you are feeling that you are reaching this number? Do you want to use your experience to say that it's very difficult to do yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> it's a wishful thing. <laughs> you have the mic up. Yeah, again, again, it's not easy. The the the, the Berlingas was nice as a as a kind of a lab to implement all of these strategies and uh, and the ideas to to work with, but in open areas normally that are multiple accesses and so uh, more than forbidden and so you have to, always to have different strategies to to do that and probably uh, like like Ricardo uh, show before the different strategies have to be applied. In a controlled way, monitoring um, investment in 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 human resources uh, that you need uh, to, to to define that it's the only way. Yeah. Yeah, that is. I mean, I, I not only to to yes to to understand and to uh, to understand it is uh, once you reach, how do you tell people okay you cannot come anymore? No, you need to again, change plan, just plan. Uh, right? uh, Again, uh, when that happens, normally you you must have a kind of like we we, we mentioned before about the lot, the limits of acceptable change. When you know that you reach that point, you just you must have a kind of a I wouldn't say a plan B, but to deploy sub management strategies to open certain areas, to invest more in uh, to to divert people to certain areas, restrict uh, access, and so uh, that uh, improve the the. The, the the monitoring of the or the cleaning of, of the areas and so so that is the thing that uh, that, that you have to 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 be as a, a red alert uh, to do that uh, uh, it's not like a theater that we have a number of tickets that uh, you you sell if it's sold out you cannot say we have that problem in for instance in, in the beaches uh, beaches in Portugal they are there are uh, public domain so everywhere are public beaches there are not private beaches and like someone mentioned in, in the in the chat one of the ways of of controlling the access special to natural beaches that are more sensitive was uh, through the car parks you have the car, the parking control and after the, the car park has has been full people uh, are not willing to to park too far away to walk to to, to the beach so it's an indirect way of controlling the access in the in in more sensitive areas. The car the, the in the natural and semi-natural beaches in Portugal, for instance, that is the, the one of the examples that I know better. The the carrying capacity has been defined by the size of the car parks instead of the size of the beach. And here is the is another situation that can can be uh, worked with. Yeah, many parts are working towards this yep. solution. Yeah. Uh... We are work, uh, talking a lot, a lot about yes, uh, current capacity of an area. But wh what uh, when there's a threatened species that is uh, suffering from this excess of visitors? How 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 this current capacity concept would work? Do you have an example? We have one, but it's a yeah. bit like like in in Berlingas, which is a very uh, restricted example. So it's easy to apply and to 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 to, to reach results. And uh, maybe more difficult if you go for other other groups. We have the, the the we've been working with the dolphin watching in Southwest, which is close to a habitat in Nepal Park. So we're talking about 45, 50 minutes uh, south from Lisbon. Um, and we have a, a, a small population of uh, bottlenose uh, dolphins uh, of 27 individuals. Okay, and for this area. We have about 56 license codes that have been uh, authorized with the proper permit to, to, to do the commercial activity of dolphin watching. <laughs> okay. These uh, 56 license codes and the number of companies that are involved is around 23 or 24. This represents more or less like 25% of the dolphin whale watching activity in Portugal mainland. I will leave Azores and Madeira on the side because they have regional autonomies and they have expressed this 
these issues in time before the, the activity started to be a problem, which is not what's happening in, in, in the continent, in mainland in Portugal. And uh, there are some rules in order how to uh, approach and to, to, to do these commercial operations. You cannot be more close than 30 meters to the animals. You need to be on the back and following the same direction. The speed, the number of boats that could be uh, looking for the animals at the same time, the duration of time that you could be close to the animals, all this is regulated. It's also a natural activity, so uh, the, the companies are also supposed to provide environment education and awareness about these species and, and provide uh, detailed numbers and some data also in order to manage the, the, the population. And uh, we, starting from this, what we have decided was let's go to the sea, let's go uh, and do trips in the sea, not as if we were being uh, uh, an extra boat going for dolphin watching, but observing what is the activity. So. Um, in each uh, sea trip, uh, every 20 to 15 minutes, we'll have a sample point and we start to triangulate our position related to the position of the other um, boats around the dolphins, the dolphins if possible, so that we could map the activity and also to measure the intensity of the activity that spread in the area. Because in these cases, it's even worse than in island because the animals could go very, very far away from the places where people uh, have access to, to the boat. So we have some some results to share here. So we did uh, nearly 100 sea trips, uh, 342 hours and over 4,000 kilometers uh, looking to the activity uh, 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 all along to three years. We have made 424 samples and we have records 150 uh, um, boat interactions, okay? So when we map all this, this is what we have, okay? This is Setubal and, and Troia, the places where most of the activity starts. Then we have some people coming also from Zimbra and another one from a beach here, uh, which is Portinda Rabida. And this is the area where the, the activity spreads, which obviously is the area where the dolphins spread around in their normal life, okay? One of the things that was very curious is that when you look to the permits that has been given by the Nature Conservation Institute, most of the companies, over more than 30 of these, these boats, are uh, licensed to operate from Zimbra to Cap Shell, and they are not licensed to operate in this area where the dolphins exist. So one of the first problems that you have is that the zoning of the permits does not match the zoning of the activity, and maybe there is some mixed use regarding this. Another important step that we have found is that uh, um, there's always this, uh, it's not my boat that is uh, um, damaging the population, it's the private boats and things like that. And we have measured and uh, uh, point to record the name of the boats and we identified all the boats. And about 80% of the activity is done by uh, licensed companies. Only 16 to 18% is done by private boats and there are some illegal operators by license, non-licensed companies and other things like imagine a fishing boat that passed by and the dolphins attracted by the fishing boats. And this was also a, a record because at the same time is another boat that is close to the animals. So this, this is need to be taken into account in, this, in these numbers. And there's a thing that's important is that the time distribution of the activity. It happens mainly in the morning, okay, and a little bit in the afternoon, but it doesn't start uh, uh, until 10 a.m., more or less, okay? The, the, the first boat, the start to operate, it's about 9.30, and it always takes a little bit to find where the animals are, okay? And sometimes they don't even find it because they spread for very large areas. And um, if we look for the, the rules that say that this activity could happen only during daylight and with three boats at the same time, for half an hour, it will be quite easy to establish the number of permits that could be uh, given for this activity. But in fact, the activity doesn't go for the entire day. It starts at 10 o'clock, there's a lunch break in this case, and then there's another part of the activity going in the afternoon. Okay. Another thing that is quite important is that although these are all, and these bars here represents one boat, okay? Although all these boats are licensed, they don't, interact, they don't act with the activity in the same way. On the blue, you have the, uh, the, the boats that uh, target this activity almost at 100%, 
they do the morning and the afternoon trip, for example, and on the gray or dark gray, you have the boats that also provide other service, like a picnic on board, an entire day sailing, that kind of stuff. And if the dolphins pass by, they also approach the dolphins a little bit, but it's not like the main activity that they, they provide. And another thing that happened was that there are some of these 56 boats that were never seen, maybe because they uh, act more in Zimbra, and instead of going for this small population, they go for coastal dolphins, for example. So there are no interactions and there are no stress coming out from those, those boats. And in some cases, we have a lot of boats that goes with other activities, like uh, renting uh, without regulation. It's not very common that these boats also target the dolphins. If the dolphins pass by where the boat is, they also target. But if you see for these uh, graphics for the three years, you have three different sets of uh, um, boats acting or interacting with the dolphins, which is important. So we're not talking about the 56. At most, what we have seen was only 29 boats were being identified in the entire three years of, of, this, of this project, okay? Another thing that is nice because we have uh, data which is specialized is that we could understand where the activity happens from the license operators, obviously all over where the dolphins go. Non-license operators, they, sorry, they just go for this more uh, um, confused area, which is close to the entrance and, and of the estuary. And it's also the same place where you have some conflict with the private boats, okay? And this is the, the hot point analysis of, of the same data. Another thing is that you have two types of companies attacked, which are the companies from Setubal and from Troya, and all the others from Arabid, uh, Putinda Arabid and Zimbra, they barely come to these to this dolphins. So if we need to split the number of the, uh, permits for this activity in particular, probably we don't need this 56 as it happens today. We could go easily with 15 to 18 permits Okay, if we also have some, some new rules, for example, it will be very important to uh, allow the dolphins to go in and out of the most uh, narrow area of the estuary on the mouth of the estuary that this area here will be a no watch area for everybody. For the boat operators, you just have to wait for five to 10 minutes until they reach a place where they could start to, um, to, to interact with the dolphins again. And for the private owner, it will be very easy to understand also that no one could do the activity. Because if you have one boat that can do it and other that can't, it's very difficult even for the um, the application of uh, regulation and the fiscalization that could happen either by the rangers of the, or the rating policy, for example. So it's very really important that we spread this. And another thing that doesn't affect the activity, but it's important in terms of the providing the animals with a little uh, more um, release pressure is that for lunchtime, for example, it will be uh, no uh, observation area for everybody so that the animals could go and they have a rest a little bit, even if there is more, more boats coming, coming later on, okay? So uh, I would uh, provide this an, as an example for an endangered species. And in this, that's not an endangered species, it's an endangered population because it's a resident population, very old and things like that. And this could be applied and translated to, 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 to other uh, aspects. Um, uh, I think that we could uh, more or less like uh, go and I'll pass to Carlos to, 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 to explain a little bit what- Could you we... just, before yep. going to this final uh, slide, okay. explain what kind of uh, impact are these visitors uh, doing on this uh, dolphin population? Why, it's, why, why? It, it, it's a tricky one because it's easy to ask people and to have their response. Their response. So we could do surveys and how do you feel about crowding? And people say, well, it's okay like that or it's too much people. But with dolphins, it's very difficult to ask them. So we need to go for uh, other aspects. For example, like in, in many cases, breeding success and things like that which are uh, normally data that requires other fields and data that usually takes much more time to, to understand. This, this uh, uh, resident population is being monitored really close since the beginning of the 80s, since they started to do photo identification for each individual, okay? So they know which is the mom of each one and which was the grandmother and all that. With, with parents is more difficult in, this, in these groups, but 
Um, there's a lot of uh, ecological and biological uh, surveys being done before. And uh, the, the, the idea that the Natural Reserve is trying to apply and the Natural Conservation Institute is to provide the animals with the most uh, quality time that they could. So um, without asking, an important stuff could be as the change regarding the number of individuals, which is the maximum, the minimum level of individuals or the minimum number of individuals that will be allowed in order to stop with the, uh, the, with the, the, the activity, for example. Because even for the boat owners, if they don't have dolphins, they cannot perform the business. So it's important, for example, to reach that, that scene. Um, one of the, in, in terms of uh, uh, whale watching, one of the aspects that is uh, usually uh, compares between uh, uh, exploited uh, uh, commercial populations or, or animals and the other ones is the time, the quality of time that mothers have with offsprings, with, uh, for example, with young chick, with young uh, dolphins and young whales, if they feed themselves properly and in comparing the, the time that they have. Uh, uh, um, the, that they have to feed themselves without being disturbed. It's very important. And it's known that where you have these commercial activities, the time that mothers and, and, and the offsprings are passing together is much low than what happens in natural and, and, and in salvage population or more far away populations. So it's tricky. That there's a lot of things that need to be taken into account. And I would say that it might be better to uh, act more strictly than to lose the resource for the activity for the companies and to lose the active for the conservation. I, I remember a case here in Portugal where there is a rock that is almost falling to the street to to to, to a to a particular uh, um, road. That road is being closed, and everybody understands that that road is closed for security reasons. The the roads the the is closed and the rock hasn't fallen yet. But it might fall tomorrow. So everybody understands, even if it to go, you need to go around, for example, to go to the same beaches, but everybody understands this. I think that with uh, some more awareness and uh, talking and discussing it with the proper stakeholders and with the public, this could be also uh, uh, achieved so that people understand. I buy my ticket to go for dolphin watching, but uh, there's a problem. So I'm not going to, to, to stress the animals anymore because I don't know. Uh, 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 one of the juveniles has died or is, is in bad shape or something like that. It might be uh, wishful thinking, but I think that we could try to, to reach that, that direction. Yes, precautionary uh, principle. And I don't know if you share my opinion uh, in that sometimes we even, we need to make assumptions. If, even if we don't have all the data as, 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 as managers, we need to, yeah, to prevent uh, this, yeah. this kind of thing. So it's... it's yeah. 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 Can, can I just yeah, stress, stress a few things yeah. that uh, <laughs> that coming over here? Uh, first, uh, first of all, is like we mentioned before, it's not a question of of just a number. Huh? It's more than, than a number, as you see here. That is the reason why we say that one thousand visitants in one area can be completely different from five thousand in another area. You have to be that really in consideration. And one of the questions that I saw here in the chat that I think it's quite interesting is about how people react to this. Is we have to invest a lot, not only what we we are doing, but why we are doing. And in many, in this is not. I'm not going to say that it's a fairy tale that you just explain and everyone be happy and we hold hands and everyone is happy. But there are more chances of of being successful. And in certain areas where the the visitation the visitation quality improved thanks to, to this. Clearly, there was a level of satisfaction improved a lot. Uh, if you go straight to the making a tax or paying, clearly people are not so happy with that. <clears throat> but again, it sometimes is one of the options that you have over here. This is um, some of the key experts that we have here <clears throat> that we already mentioned. Uh, with the complexity, the zoning, clearly, that, like I've been mentioning over here. But from all of this, again, <clears throat> I want, <clears throat> sorry, I want to stress the last one, good data. You must monitor and not after the determining the, the, the a value, you should stop from there. You just have to keep monitoring. We are doing that in Berlangish. 
and that is really crucial for for the su success having good data for developing yep yes, what recommendation would you give to a protected area manager that is envisaging uh, or would like to do this current capacity in his or her protected area do you have any recommendation how to start uh, how do i take the good data uh how, how do I start the process? Maybe this could be like the final remarks, but yes. first one, you need to you need to know what you're dealing with. So the starting point is, yeah. is a starting point. Without knowing, you, you could manage, you could forbid an activity or allow an activity without having data, but you're going to have a problem either with the stakeholders or with the resource or with the conservation values that are set in, in that place. Um, then uh, I think that monitor, uh, monitoring is, is key. You need to keep uh, doing this. Obviously, mm -hmm. that it costs a lot of money to characterize because it needs huge teams. Some of the results that we've been doing there in Catalonia is being done with 25 persons at the same time doing questionnaires and asking people where you're coming from, spread around uh, all the different influence in Colcerola, for example, uh, which is which is very expensive. But then you should go for uh, shorter uh, um, surveys and shorter methods that could help to monitor. And what we have tested in Berlin is what's very nice. We started with the 1,500 questionnaires for the result, for the, the overall look on, on what's happening. And now we could have this uh, visitation parameter working easily with 150 questionnaires, which is much less and much easier to accommodate even uh, um, uh, voluntary work and things like that regarding this. Then I think that it's very, very, very important that you have your management goals regarding what you're dealing with. If you just say, I want to, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with uh, carrying capacity, but you don't have a proper object or, or a very defined object, it's going to be one thing in one year and the year that after that is going to be a different one because you haven't realized what you're dealing with. In Berlengas, it's a very nice example because most of the conservation issues that are needed to be taken into account happen in, before the visitation starts, which is uh, the, 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 the breeding of the marine uh, seabirds that, that live around there, for example. So when you have visitation, most of the chicks are already grown and already starting to, 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 to fly, so there is no big problem. But in other places, this could be very, very important, okay? then uh, you need to involve everybody and it's interactive. People need to understand that even when we start with all the good ideas and with our strategy and, 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 and plan, okay, it might change it. And it might change this due to the opinion of others that are involved with this or because the data that we have from the beginning were, was not good enough in order to understand what was, uh, uh, what was passing in, 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 that, in that moment. And, it's really never a magic number because there are so many different things that we could change uh, behaviors, expectations, uh, uh, satisfaction. I, 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 I behave myself differently if I go to a shopping center and it's crowded, even if I need to go to that place, okay? So this mm -hmm. might happen also in, in, in a lot of things. So the same person could go as a recreational uh, mountain biker in one day, and the day after that is a father with a young child, and then the, the speed that the, the, the bike that was being ride and the day, day before starts to be a problem. But when I was riding without my kids in front of the bicycle, it was not a problem at all. Okay, so th th there's a lot of things that need to be uh, taken into account, and uh, I would Put these final remarks as a really, really starting points to deal with the uh, carrying capacity in, in whatever place needs to be taken into account. Thank you very much for these final remarks. I don't know, Carlos, if you want what any. No, no, just, just to saying that uh, yeah. we don't live in a, in the ideal world, so there's this means that probably uh, you need the, the the characterization, the good data, and so and so and so. But if you don't have all of that. You cannot expect for having all the perfect uh, setting to start doing the things. You have to work with the things as you have um, as you can, and having a kind of uh, precautionary uh, approach, like you mentioned before, uh, in case of not having the the 
the best data uh, as possible. And, and, and clearly, uh, just answering in a more straight way to your last question, if you were a, a park manager and if uh, how to start with, I think is first you must to 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 know how many are going over there and if that is a problem. I think that that is the 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 first thing that we have to know. <clears throat> and that, after that, you start doing the strategy according to the, your your management goals and so. But uh, like people stress here in in the in the chat, and we already probably mentioned this a couple of times. Sometimes we have perceptions that are not according to the reality. So, uh, and we we must have the information for having the the best decisions made. Thank you so much, Ricardo and Carlos, for today's webinar. Uh, we know, uh, everyone knows in the protected area management, that is a very complex topic that uh, is uh, also difficult decisions to make, to, to, to decide to, to, to put like somehow limits. Uh, I mean, of course, to do all the studies, to, to understand our reality, to have clear objectives, to perhaps to work in a network so that we decide yeah. as, a, as a whatever, eh, province or municipalities, where to conduct the people, what type of people to attract, more naturalists, or, or I mean, everyone has a right or, to, to go to nature. So. All, all these reflections that need to be done at, uh, and, and take management uh, objectives so that uh, after we can uh, make these calculations and, 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 and make these uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, from Europark Federation, we we want to, to, to work uh, on, on, on this topic, uh, very complex topic. We are collecting case studies on that, so uh, we will invite everyone in, in today's uh, webinar, if you have experience to share, to go to our website and, and submit a, a case study. Please, before leaving uh, today's session, if you could answer um, a survey, that we, a satisfactory survey to about this we webinar, my colleagues are going to put the link. And... Uh, that's it for today. Really, thank you very much for your participation. This webinar has been a bit different. We wanted to have it more freshly, more lively. Of course, uh, it could have been seen a bit disorganized, and there's a lot of questions uh, that were not answered. Uh, but um, this is all related to the, the to the type of uh, topic, which is very hot, and there's different views on it, as, as, as I saw in the chat, but I, I didn't manage eh, to, to follow all of it. And uh, this leaves that uh, we will still work on that and probably we will do another webinar following this one later uh, this year or the next year because we realize that it's a very, very attra um, yeah, attractive uh, topic. Thank you very much and have a nice weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye, cheers, thank you. Thank you.